and I'd like to welcome everyone to the City of Santa Clarita's, Clarita's Virtual Arts Symposium. <laughs> I'm here today with some really talented filmmakers, and we're going to talk about film distribution. This is Be Seen, Film Distribution Tips and Tricks. So I'm really excited to have everyone here today and for you all to tune in virtually. Um, sometimes it's hard to get a talented group together. I find virtually sometimes it's easier. So I'm really excited about our speakers today. Um, so we have Katie McLean, a two-time Emmy Award winner, and she directed Seeing is Believing Women Direct, and I really love hearing her distribution process with that film. Um, also, Liz Manischel, a formerly Sundance Creative Distribution Initiative and Fiction Motion, Picture Motion. I always want to flip those. Picture Motion, and she's embarking on a new venture, which I'm sure she'll tell us about later. And then we have Lisha Yakub, who you're the director of sales and distribution at Recon Productions now, which I think mm -hmm. is relatively new. It is. Or maybe it's I just hadn't heard. No, it's, <laughs> it's new. We're just getting going. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm excited to hear about all of that. So um, we're going to start with each of them sharing their personal distribution experiences. I'm Jennifer Fisher. I'm with Think 10 Media Group. Um, I've done distribution and producing with my own company, um, but I'm really wanting to hear from these ladies. So, Katie, since you're right below me on the screen, I'm going to start with you. Okay. <laughs> you can share a little bit about your experience um, with Seeing is Believing, Women Direct, and, and other projects as well, but I know that's a really personal, important project for you. Sure. Okay. So, um, as you know, my name is Katie McLean, and uh, I'm known mostly as an actor, but I went into directing. Um, in uh, early 2012, 10, somewhere around there. And um, uh, I made a couple shorts and then I really loved it passionately. And I decided to make a documentary film about female directors. Um, this became a five year journey of not only starting out with making a short, but then uh, making a, uh, being encouraged to make it a one hour feature. And now it is an 84 minute feature. And in terms of distribution, um, uh, you know, my journey was starting with a lawyer, uh, which is Lisa Califf of Donaldson and Califf. Um, I knew that because I was a first time documentary filmmaker, I really wanted to work with a great um, uh, lawyer, documentary lawyer. And there's some of, they are the best, I think, uh, in the business. They're the most trusted. And so I knew that she would guide me and help me make sure that I didn't make stupid first timer mistakes, which can really cost you a lot. Like there are some, mm -hmm. some new, new, um, really wonderful documentary filmmakers who just don't know that you can't just claim fair use. You have to have a lawyer tell you that, give you the, a letter that you've proven that you have, you know, a right to call this fair use if you use clips and, um, and uh, you know, uh, a kind of a cool thing happened. I was approached by Gravitas at the end of um, the, I finished the, the well, one hour version. And yet I felt like I didn't want to go, with an aggregator, I was feeling um, very much like an, a, 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 a pissy independent. I wanted to do it my way. I didn't want somebody to just put the film out there. I wanted to, you know, uh, my husband is also a filmmaker and he had made a, a narrative feature where he had a good and an awful um, experience in distribution where his, his narrative feature was distributed um, but then he had, uh, you know, the aggregator not pay, and then he had um, another aggregator um, of the DVD Blu-ray who ended up in prison. So <laughs> I was like, that's not going to happen to this film. I've got to protect this film. So um, I finally, after I've made the 84-minute version of the film, I've learned a lot since then, and, you know, um, I understand that sometimes you do have to make a choice about, and I talk to everybody. I talk to Peter Broderick. I talk to um, Keith Ochoad. I, I, I worked with Impact Media Partners, which is a, um, a you know an impact film um, kind of guiding team. Uh, I just learned and studied and studied and learned, and um, uh, and I finally finally got a, a sales agent. Um, through doing a lot of press, um, she heard me on um, KUCI and, and, and contacted me through LinkedIn. Her name's Jenny Hayden. And she got me a deal with APT, American Public Television, to get the film onto PBS. So now we're finally, finally, finally going to be on eight uh, regional PGA, PBS stations. And I think you were very clear, Katie, of what you want to do with your film. It helped guide you through this process that I think for a lot of filmmakers is really overwhelming. What do I do with my film? How do I distribute it? I've done all the hard work. You think it's the hard work, right? And so you start distributing and you feel like that's its own set of hard work. But that key question that you landed on there, of what do we want 
to do with our film is, is so essential. And having that focus as you embark on the distribution process, I think is, is critical. Totally. And, and just to wrap that up, I mean, I realized that I was inspired by documentaries that were on PBS when I was a kid. And so that was really, truly my goal. It didn't have to be like the big PBS. I wanted it to be the little PBS for, you know, people who were still watching TV with rabbit ears, because that was the group that I made the film for women who didn't think they could get into the business, who, who didn't have hope necessarily that they could become a filmmaker and have somebody tell them, I see you, I know you're out there and I know you can, I know you can do it if you want to do it and here's how. So, you know, that was my goal. And um, after that, we're hoping to, you know, get into, uh, or I could tell you my whole nightmare story. I had a, I had an educational, I did a year of educational and the educational distributor went bankrupt. Um, I had a uh, new, I have a new educational distributor, Collective Eye, and now they're getting it out on um, a Canopy, which is awesome. And so, you know, we're doing like tiny step, a tiny step, but it's been years. It, it takes a really long time and I'm, I'm glad I've been careful um, and found the right people. Um, but at the same time, it's just, it's been just agony. <laughs> <laughs> and I think how long the process is, is something independent filmmakers, especially maybe aren't um, prepared for, you know, a lot mm. of times people don't warn us of this, or we hear these stories and the, the way it makes it sound is that your film was at Toronto or Sundance, and then you were off to the races and there you go. And like, it's this magical, like fairy godmother that poofs you into existence. And really you're missing so many of the twists and turns behind the scenes and all of the time that goes into it. So, you know, I think that's a really good point. It's, it's years and um, people need to be aware and, and be prepared, you know, yeah, for sure. And love sure. the project, hopefully, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's a baby that you're, you're like a child, you're, you're growing it up and putting it out there. And just because it's out there and I'm sure Liz and Leisha will, um, you know, agree with me in that, you know, you, once it's out there, that doesn't mean it's done, you know, mm -hmm. out into the world, you got to keep, T telling people about it and guiding it and now where does it go next and yeah. you know it's a long process yeah. yeah definitely definitely so Liz you're in this long process with one of your films you've done it with other films so go ahead why don't you share your experience <laughs> uh Okay, so I'm a feature writer director producer with two features under my belt and um I fell into a job working for a man that Katie referenced named Peter Broderick, just because it was like the only job available and it sounded like it worked with my schedule. And then through osmosis, I kind of absorbed that distribution was important and audience building was important. And then in, uh, when The Orchard uh, released my first feature, um, I had to negotiate the contract and I didn't know that you could negotiate a contract. And I didn't know what um, aspects of the contract you could negotiate. And I learned through uh, working with Peter who negotiated my first distribution contract. And then um, Sundance um, evolved a department they had called Artist Services to this new department called the Creative Distribution Initiative. So my expertise that I've grown through working with Peter and working at Sundance and Picture Motion and now um, as an independent consultant um, is all in this very small subset called creative distribution, which is what do you do when you don't want to do a traditional all rights deal? What if you want to self-distribute? What if you want to split up your rights, um, retain some, exploit some with one partner over here and another partner over here? Um, and that's what I did at Sundance. I advised Sundance filmmakers, Jen, you were saying like, you think you get it to Sundance, right? And then the world to Oyster. We had a whole department to service and support Sundance filmmakers who did not get, um, you know, home run deals or wanted to own their film and wanted to exploit it in different ways so that they can control the marketing, control the messaging and know that they're not being taken advantage of by barnacles on the bottom of ships, i.e. bad distributors. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, so I worked at Sundance in this department for three years. And then from there, I worked in impact distribution, which is like a section of distribution where um, you work mainly in the semi-theatrical vein and you uh, try to help filmmakers achieve their impact goals. Uh, we were an agency. So um, an example, quick example of impact distribution is if a filmmaker makes a film about um, single-use plastic and you 
organize screenings and you work with a fulfillment company to provide bamboo straws. This is like you provide a solution and you're working with the filmmaker with their impact goals to change the world through one or many actions. Um, I worked with Picture Motion for the past year, learned a lot about impact, and then I've decided, hey, I want to be my own boss. And so um, I quit three weeks ago. <laughs> and, wow. um, and so right now I've started working with Film Collaborative and I've started working on my own just independently with filmmakers. I'm passionate about making sure we don't get taken advantage of. I'm passionate um, because I think distribution is like this really cathartic, wonderful experience and I want to make sure it goes right. So I'm like trying to be a doula for, <laughs> for <laughs> distribution, I guess it's like my new thing. I haven't figured out my brand yet, but it'll be uh, solidified in the next few months. That's cool. Distribution. Great. <laughs> well, I mean, but if, may I, I'm sorry. I was just like, well, Liz, like you, I mean, for me, like, because the films that you made are these, you know, really rugged, independent films, D, I, Y, all the way. You know, I, mm -hmm. I always think of you like that as like the champion of the DIY filmmaker. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm always like, God bless Liz is out there. <laughs> she's out there. She's swinging. She's doing it. You know, so. Yeah. I really believe in grass, grassroots filmmaking and Me grassroots too. distribution. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I love our people. I love our people of like the micro budget or whatever we want to call us. These like DIY filmmaker world um, because we're driven by passion um, and we're not necessarily all driven by profit though. We all should be compensated much better than we are. Uh, <laughs> but we're driven to tell um, we're driven to scratch that itch that's in our souls to tell stories. And so I, I like, I like our people and I'm, I think Lisa is probably one of those people too, but I'm sure she is. <laughs> she wants to tell her own story. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah, perfect segue. Lisha. You ladies are awesome. It's, it's great to be on this panel with all of you. Um, so as Jen mentioned, I am director of sales and distribution for a company called Recon Productions. And I go way back with the owners of that company. We all went to college together. Um, and we kind of went our different ways upon graduation. We, we went to USC. Um, and I, I worked at Sony Pictures um, and uh, John Michael Kondrath founded Recon Productions. And so it's been in business for about 10 years and they are, their whole mandate and intent is to support the independent filmmaker. They're in the business of sharing stories and giving independent filmmakers resources that they might not otherwise have when it comes to knowing crew and making sure that you're taking the right steps to not um, have a big pitfall at the end of your journey. Um, that you can stay on budget and actually get a finished product at the end. So they really specialize in those types of production services and um, have a studio space and equipment and all of that. Um, and they have a post-production department, but the one aspect that was missing was what do we do with these films when they're done? And um, I obviously kept in touch with John, but then we reconnected at a PGA event um, just in just this past January. Um, and he was like, you know, I'm really scratching my head about this film. We produced it and I think it has a lot of potential for distribution, but we just have no idea where to start. And I had background in that because after I worked at Sony Pictures, I then went into um, independent film um, representation at a law firm. And my job was to place films for the, for the, for the attorney. Um, and package and sell. And I, I met a lot of sales agents and distributors. And I was just like, I kind of took it for granted, really, because I was like 22. And had I was just kind of embarking on my like serious career in the entertainment industry and didn't really realize that this is such a resource that most filmmakers don't, um, don't stumble into, because it takes so much energy and effort to actually produce. Um, and actually distributing and getting your film out there is a production in itself. Um, once you even find a dis distributor, then you have to deliver the film and that's like going back into production all over again. Um, so that kind of happened, that chance uh, reconnection in January, uh, com that conversation led to a new department in Recon, which is the sales and distribution department. 
And we formally launched it this past March, which was really great timing because <laughs> um, production froze. So <laughs> um, that was incredibly serendipitous. And um, and then I, I actually had my first child in July, so I was slowing down anyways. And this kind of was a, a really nice, um, nice way to, to, to keep things going, really. Um, we, we have one film that we're working with, um, very, very talented filmmaker. It was his first feature film. Um, and he worked with Recon Productions to handle, you know, filming everything. Um, the film is called The Hyperions. And uh, it's, it stars Carrie Elwes, we know him mostly from Princess Bride. Um, and it's, it's kind of like if, what if superheroes um, turned on the, 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 the source that gave them their power um, and it kind of created this like dysfunctional family of superheroes and the professor that gave them their, their powers. Um, so very fun kind of action drama um, with, a, with a really nice heart and twist to it. So I had watched it and immediately said, this, this is a great first project to work on. Um, this is, and, and I look for elements of like, I, does the filmmaker actually need our support? Is this knowledge that they don't have? Because I don't want to get involved when they don't need us. That would just be taking a cut or a fee, you know, where they didn't need to give that up. Um, so I kind of assess, can we be useful? And in this case, absolutely, we could be useful. And then we also assess where does this film have a place in the market? Um, and we, we were assessing at a time when we didn't really know where the market was at. Um, no one really knew. Um, all the festivals were being canceled. And I think initially the filmmaker's goal was to put this into festivals. Um, but that, that was kind of a little bit of a, a, a shift. Um, and what ended up happening with it was we put it into the virtual can market um, that there was two that happened and there was one that was like a little more exclusive. It was only like 30 something um, sales agents that were allowed to participate. And so we kind of targeted those sales agents um, to see if one of them wanted to take the film and we were able to close a deal with one of them. Um, and so they were able to represent it in, in a, a more kind of organized, less clutter-filled way. Um, they did, it was all done on Zoom. Um, they did presentations, you know, for different time zones and it was kind of like a pre-recorded um, presentation. Uh, they, they did the trailer and like some behind the scenes interviews that fortunately the filmmaker had the foresight to do um, when they were in production. So that was great um, to have had that. And, um, the, I think given the climate, it turned out to be very successful. It, it just happens a lot slower though, because it's, everyone has, still has to screen the film, but they're not doing it on their own time. Whereas in a traditional market, the, the sales agent would host a screening, invite all of the potential buyers and everyone watches it at the same time. Um, now they get the link and can watch it and pause it and go take care of their kids and then come back and, you know, um, so, so we're, we're see I definitely saw like, okay, this is taking a lot longer to actually, you know, get responses from buyers, but we're, we're a few months out now and, and it's looking like it's still pretty healthy um, in that regard. But yeah, that, and I'm also a producer. So I, I produced two feature films. Um, one was distributed with Mar Vista and it, it went on to Netflix. And another one was distributed with Screen Media and that one went on to Amazon Prime initially. And um, when I produce, I like to produce content that um, generally is targeted more to like a younger audience. Like I, I love the kid adventure story. I, I don't know if you can see the posters behind me, but like E.T., Willy Wonka, um, Young Frankenstein, that's my husband's pick, Jurassic Park. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, those are the types of stories I like to produce um, that kind of bring joy and empathy to our world, which we need so much right now. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And already like so much information coming out. And I think before we dig into, which Lisha, you started this segue of, of how the pandemic has changed distribution for filmmakers, definitely 
different considering film festivals is different. Um, we're all probably consuming more media content than we ever were before, but it's just better for filmmakers in a, at the independent level or not. But before we get into that, I'm wondering if one of you wants to be brave enough to tackle, we've heard these words, aggregator, sales agent, producers rep, distributor, maybe everyone that's joining us today knows what every single thing of those are, you know, what all those roles are, but maybe some people joining don't. So does anyone feel like tackling that? And, you know, what is an aggregator and what are these different things, these different pathways? So who's brave? I can tackle distributor. Nominate oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to nominate you. <laughs> like, I'll tackle a few, yes. but I actually, it gets murky for me in the difference between producers, rep and sales agent. And mm -hmm. um, like, I'd love to hear um, what everyone else how everyone else defines that. But um, distributor is someone, um, let me start with aggregator because I'm more familiar with aggregators. Aggregator, so uh, it's a service. It's a company that provides a service for you. So you will pay them an upfront fee and they will take your assets. And by assets, I mean your feature, um, you know, your, your film, uh, your trailer, your key art, like your movie poster, um, closed captions, subtitles, all these things that combine to be your deliverables. You give them to the aggregator or they, you pay for the creation of some of these assets up front. And they provide the service of quality controlling, doing quality control on those assets, making sure they're okay to go up on open platforms, like something like iTunes or Google Play. And then they put them up on those platforms. You've paid them and then all the money goes back to the rights holder. So it goes back to you if you own, um, if you are the LLC old, uh, owner or if you're the uh, filmmaker who owns the film. So uh, an aggregator, will not, uh, they will sometimes do pitches to curated platforms like a Netflix or Hulu or Vudu, uh, but they have, I'm just going to go out and say, they don't have a great track record because it's a volume industry. So their pitches um, are a little bit less successful than a distributor might do. And, um, and they don't put any marketing muscle uh, behind your film because you're just paying for them for the service of getting your film up on an open platform. Uh, a distributor will it changes and every distributor acts differently uh, but uh, in most cases these days uh, you will work with a distributor they will set a marketing cap the amount of money that they're willing to spend to promote your film you'll figure out your split which is the division of revenue between you and them it's usually 70, 30, 70 to that 70 to you 30 to them uh, and they will Put your film out into the world and then in the waterfall they'll take 30 percent of the revenue that comes out after the platforms take their take i'm realizing i bit off so much more than i should have <laughs> because i'm like i'm now like should we talk about curated versus open platforms like should we get into all these fun things point is a distributor puts their skin in the game and they invest in you and the film. Um, and they also take money out when the film is making money in the marketplace and aggregator is just a service. I'll stop. I'll let someone else take on something else. Yeah. I just wanted to throw in like I called gravitas an aggregator. They're not really an aggregator. They're a distributor and they can give you a, they, you know, would offer and offered us an MG, which is a minimum guarantee, which is money up front. Um, and then, you know, just as Liz was saying, like they, they do a very a similar thing to an aggregator in that they will put them out on all the platforms and you can discuss that. That's all negotiable to a certain degree. Um, and then those, there's all these fees involved. And I think that's the sort of the tricky aspect of distribution is you think you're going to get, let's say, I mean, we should break this down, Liz, let's, let's do a good breakdown of iTunes. How about that? This is, this is what made me crazy and be like, I'm going totally independent, you know, <laughs> like, because like iTunes, so the, the distributor or aggregator gets charged by iTunes and that charge to put it up on the platform and that charge gets passed down to the filmmaker. So let's just say it's roughly $500. Um, and then you, that that platform will charge 60%. I think Amazon charges 50. I think iTunes is, no, Amazon charges 60. iTunes charges 50% of 
Like I know old rates down. then, but yes, there's some sort of platform take, right? Yeah, there's a, they, they take a nice big fat chunk and then your distributor aggregator will take their chunk and then the filmmaker gets their chunk, which is why you, you see that your film has made this much money and your check is this big. <laughs> to follow up on that, because if we are really going to go into iTunes as like a little microcosm of this yeah. big system, if you work with an aggregator to get your film on iTunes, they can do it. But a distributor, if they have a good relationship with iTunes and their merchandising department, like the promotional department of the platform, you could get notable indie or like you could get on that cool carousel or the jumbotron or all these cool things on Apple TV. You could get um, organic promotion through iTunes promotion of your film, whereas an aggregator can't call up iTunes and be like, can you shine a light on my cool film that just submitted and paid me $500 to get on here? Because it's an aggregator and it's a volume industry, right? Which is why there's like the, the two different ways where I always say like it's a relationship industry. And so if you, if you pick a distributor who wants to have, who has those relationships with those platforms so they can hustle your movie and get it seen, or you go wildly indie and you've collected a million emails and you're, you've got relationships with your independent people and or schools or whatever, and you're willing to do that grunt work and let people know, hey, this film is out here. You know, you can see it here, here and here, you know, but that's a, that's the, becomes a, a it becomes like a part-time job. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. I did it for one of our features um, and we did well, we did make our money back, but I mean, I, I worked my took this off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea that it's easy or you just make it and throw it up on iTunes or wherever, you know, I think it, it's sobering. I think when people start doing it and realize it's yeah. really that simple. Yeah. Um, oh, and also that it has, it doesn't have anything to do with how good the movie is. It right. has a lot to do with who is pushing the movie and where it is being placed and where it can be found to be seen. Right. And I think going back to your question from the beginning of what do you want to do with this film determines all of those things or, or should determine, I think, for the filmmaker, all of those choices you're going to make. Do you need a producer's rep? Do you need a distributor? Do you need an aggregator? If you are doing a niche film that you have a relationship already to the audience, then maybe you should hold those rights for yourself and do that grunt work. If you have no relationship and you haven't built an audience, then maybe, you know, finding the right distributor is the answer. So knowing what your film is and what you want to do with it, I think is the first question I always tell filmmakers to ask me to, to answer. If they can't answer that, then it's really hard to know the best next step for them. Um, and right now, can we, can we put Alicia on, Alicia on the spot? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> I, Alicia, could you clarify producer's rep versus sales rep versus sales agent? I knew you wanted agent? to go there. I was waiting yeah. for her to be ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I would love to. Thank you for calling me out on that one. So I actually operate mostly as a producer's rep. And it's, they, they, really, they really come down to the difference between the three. It's really what, whose interests are they looking out for? So the producer's rep is going to be looking out for the actual producers of the film. Um, sales agents are going to be mostly just trying to, I mean, they look out for the film as well, of course, um, a, a good sales agent would do that, but their relationships are primarily with buyers. Like they know, I always use this as example of a guy in Germany that owns a TV station that needs content for his TV station in Germany. Um, sales agents are gonna know those people. They attend all the markets um, that happen, whether they're virtually or happening in person, they're still attending and talking with these relationships with actual buyers um, that, that they've built for, you know, over many, many years. Um, and then the producer's rep has relationships that they've built over many, many years with these sales agents. So they kind of can be a, 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 a a good way to suss out like who's a trusted sales agent, who has a good track record, um, and also be able to walk you through the terms and the agreement. Like I'll, I actually negotiate um, the kind of the key terms in the agreement and then we pass it off to an entertainment attorney who can kind of go through the actual contract and like make sure that every single clause is, is where it should be. Um, but there are all sorts of things like uh, Katie, you mentioned a minimum guarantee. 
And that's something that you negotiate for. You, you know, you kind of say, well, listen, you can take a higher cut if you want, instead of 15%, you could take 20%. Um, but can you give us $50,000 up front? And that will kind of help us produce some of the assets that we need to produce for you um, to be able to get it out into the world. Um, and the line between sales agent and distributor gets a little blurry as well, because a lot of sales agents are distributors as well. Like Gravitas is considered in some instances a sales agent, or sometimes they just directly distribute it. Um, and the difference there is it, like with, I know in particular with Gravitas, when they're doing international sales or anything international, they're not plugged in directly to like the direct TV of Germany. Um, where they could just release it directly onto a video on demand platform or a streaming platform. Um, and so they will contract with, you know, the, in that instance, they would act as a sales agent and contract with, um, with someone. Oh, can everyone hear me? Is my audio back? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, they'll contract with someone in Germany that does have a direct relationship with the direct TV of Germany. Um, and there is something cool. I don't know if we touched on streaming, um, but we are seeing more worldwide deals because of, you know, Netflix has now been international, um, for, I think they went international fully around the world in like 2014, 2015. Um, but for the longest time, it was just in the United States and a little bit in Canada. And we don't realize that because, for us, it's, it was just such a big deal in the United States, but um, on the international sales market, um, that was still a carve out. If you got a Netflix deal, it did not include international rights. Now, when you are approached by Netflix, um, they want worldwide because they want to be able to just put it up on um, all of their versions of Netflix um, all over the world and not have to tailor it back. And that is a little bit of a hindrance for the independent filmmaker because you kind of lose out on those extra grabs from different territories. Um, uh, traditionally, you would see like on a budget, uh, on the micro budget level, um, like under 500,000, like you could see up to a million dollars in international sales to alone, um, so depending on the genre and who stars in it and all that stuff. <laughs> so. Um, what and that's something that we have you know you have to consider in this just jumping in on that like um i was speaking to somebody recently who was like you know still to this day like sylvester stallone and jean claude mm -hmm. van damme yeah. you know and guys like that are considered uh you know a very very desirable assets to have yeah. in a film like you can yeah. raise your investment with names like that still Absolutely. Which is <laughs> wild. Claude Van Damme in the film would still sell great. And Nicolas Cage, too. Well, that's because <laughs> Nicolas Cage is a god. And he's yeah. my favorite actor. <laughs> I'm obsessed with him. Yeah. But like, something be clear here. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Jen. Sorry. No, just, just, I'm just saying, just to be clear. No, I think, um, yeah, the international marketplace, you know, Netflix has changed that game for mm -hmm. sure. And then now this whole market, I think, is changing again. And we are consuming yeah. more media. And I think mm -hmm. for some filmmakers, they think then this is the time to get my film out. It will be easier. And maybe it's easier, but maybe it's harder because we have so many choices and yeah. cutting through the noise um, is really hard. And also I think comfort. For me, I'm re-watching a lot right now. Yeah. Like of these <laughs> things that are older and bring me comfort instead of watching as much. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Lost your audio, Jen. Yeah, I don't hear you, Jen. Act opportunities yeah. for independent yeah. filmmakers right now with a film to distribute. Did the question come through? I, I think we're not fully current current opportunities for Yeah. So if yeah. you have a film to distribute right now and you're an independent filmmaker. Yeah. It's different, right? The film festival landscape is different. Mm -hmm. The distribution landscape is different. Yeah. What does this mean for you? How has the pandemic shifted what's available or not available and how you should approach it? 
I would love to like dial it back even more like because like sure. what is the definition of independent right because these days you know how indie is indie right you, you know are you dealing with a fifty thousand dollar budget 250 right. you know under a million do you have two and a half million and you're calling yourself an independent filmmaker you know there's there's mm -hmm. levels 500 you know like right. um yeah. and there is also this thing where I'd, I'd love to just kind of like pop the bubble on this that everybody thinks that they can get into Sundance or Toronto or, <laughs> you know, uh, South by it, it, again, it, it, and people hate, hate it when I say this, but it's a matter of fact, like most of the films that get into those festivals, um, sorry, I have a cat that will have his way. Um, <laughs> um, have a, have a, <laughs> wow. It's just my day. It's my day. It's like, stop talking lady. Um, that's just a little plastic tray and no problem. Um, have a sales, uh, they have an agent, they have an agent that has yeah. a relationship with that festival and they're already trying to put, you know, they're connecting with those festivals to say, Hey, you know, spotlight this film, spotlight this look, look, make sure you look at this film when you're judging. Now that doesn't mean that the judges don't look at all the other films that are, are submitted because I know they do, but mm -hmm. there's a special <laughs> kind of, um, you know, effort made to also consider the films that are being uh, brought to them by the agents of William Morris and ICM and CAA mm -hmm. and all of that. So in terms of independent, know that you're also going up against the beast, you know what I mean? Of like the business of independent filmmaking, which is, you know, very, very, uh, you know, it's a big deal, you know, in, in Hollywood. Yeah. It may seem like it's not, it's, it's, it's only studio films, but it's not. The indie world has its own sort of like higher level, you know, area. So I was going to say being a DIY fighter for the little guy always, um, you know, there's Seed and Spark, which is, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I put my film on Seed and Spark because it's oh, for filmmakers, cool. by filmmakers. Yeah. And it's done really well there, you know, and uh, it's helping the people who want to yeah. make films who are crowdfunding for their films, yeah. the movies about that you can, you know, encourage you to keep going. So that was a good fit for me early, yeah. you know, early on. And, um, so I just wanted to put a shout out to Seed and Spark because they do yeah. so much for the for the truly indie people out there. And they, well, really yeah, help, they, they really help to form a community around each film. And I think mm. that is, is something interesting for filmmakers, especially right now, to clue into. And I know you guys touched on it a little bit of like, do you have a dedicated audience for your film or do you need help finding it? And right now, because everything is so digital and we're also online, the, the 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 lines between territories are so blurred. I mean, we can be talking with some people all over the world right now. And we're getting information almost in real time. There's not that kind of divide between countries phys physically right now because we all kind of exist in this digital space together. And it's a good time to for filmmakers to really put a lot of importance on like a social media plan. Like, how are you publicizing your film as you're filming, as you're making it or in, or whatever stage you're in? Um, who, who do you want to watch this? Who are you making it for? Well, they're out, they're online. Reach out to them. Everyone is existing online. It's really rare that people are tuning out social media, you know, completely right now because it's a prime, primarily how we interact with everyone. So though the people that weren't even on before are now on social media platforms. Except, except for everyone who watched The Social Dilemma in the past two weeks. Yeah, I haven't watched that <laughs> yet on purpose. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, it, <laughs> well, and I think those platforms are changing. I'm seeing people moving away from Facebook, but more onto Twitter and Slack yeah. and Discord. And my company, we're going to be starting a Discord soon and kind of shifting yeah. where we spend our time socially. So I think... Yeah transition but I think building that community yeah anywhere you are in a pipeline as a filmmaker if you're in pre-production if you're in production mm -hmm. post you're distributing you can still do this it's something that yeah. you need to be doing no matter where you are yeah. in the pipeline of filmmaking you know yeah. is building that audience thinking about who what are your films and who are they for yeah. and Katie speaking to the film festival thing um with my film smuggled you know we didn't go for any of the top tier because mm -hmm. we it was a small micro budget film with no name talent, but it told an immigration story and was partially in mm -hmm. Spanish. So we just attacked the Latin film festivals yeah. and we did really, really well. And that helped us with our self distribution process. Cause then when I started approaching mainly colleges, universities, community centers, 
they were really excited and those accolades mattered to them. I don't know if the Sundance would have mattered to them. It's, mm-hmm. you know, because it's a different audience and it's a different thing. Mm-hmm. And still when we were moving, we shot outside of our house, we were moving, this guy stopped. He's like, oh my gosh, did you know your, your house is in a movie? And we're like, <laughs> what? We thought maybe somebody shot something that we didn't know. And he was talking about our movie that he had seen. And you know, our film's eight years old. It's kind of, mm. I don't hear people talk about it anymore, that particular film. And so it was really cool that this, you know, this Hispanic man in my community had recently seen our film, you know? And maybe on Amazon, maybe on Seed and Spark, I don't really know. But you know, it's like, it has its legs within the community that we targeted with our outreach, you know, mm-hmm. instead of wasting our time targeting maybe somewhere else, you know, we really said who is really going to appreciate this film. And we really targeted that audience well, I think. And having mm-hmm. the filmmaker also, my partner, be partially Hispanic and fluent in Spanish really helped too. So I think thinking about those things too, when you're going after your audience, can you talk to them in a way that resonates with them? Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think it's really, really important. Well, I wanted to address part of your question. Um, maybe it's the question beneath the question, Jen, from a few yeah. minutes ago, which is like when you're deciding right now whether to release your film because we're in a global pandemic and streaming rates are up, like how, how do you make that decision? Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, streaming is up, but um, ad revenue is being squeezed. So even mm-hmm. though your film may be seen more, mm-hmm. we're still in a major economic chaos, right? Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily mean that it's going to be a slam dunk for you in terms of um, income for your LLC or revenue. So I just, back to what we've been saying this whole time, figure out what's most important to you. If eyeballs are most important to you, you've got a captive audience and you can get that film out by yourself on Amazon Prime right now. I think it takes three to five days if you upload it yourself and you have all the assets. Um, but if you're thinking that money is, is where is of primary importance to you, um, there are new SVOD platforms, you know, there's Peacock, mm-hmm. there's HBO Max, there's new platforms that are coming up and trying to compete with Netflix mm-hmm. and Hulu. There are more chances for license fees. But then I also just want to put a burst our bubble uh, yet again. Airlines used to be a really meaningful <laughs> avenue <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for filmmakers and now like, <laughs> Nothing, right? Yeah. No one's flying. So you you really hotels, have to, to hotels, hotels, cruise ships, yeah. and yeah. prisons. I mean, think of all the prisoners who got <laughs> left free recently. Okay, bad bad political joke. Um, but like, just think about what are what are your priorities? Just like we did saying over and over again. Um, yes, you have a captive audience, but you may not be making the most amount of money if you release it right now. And just think very. Yeah. Thoughtfully, and um, what's most important is to find really good, transparent, honest partners yeah. to release your film with, rather than to like rush your film out to market in the midst of all of this, um, yeah. all of this so, that we're going through. And, and I How also want to note that. Oh, oh, go ahead, Lisa. I was just going to say uh, the other the other avenue of distribution that's kind of a moot point right now is theatrical, um, because. Right theaters aren't open or they're limitedly open. And even if they are, people aren't really wanting to go. Um, but virtual theatrical is actually making filmmakers money. I mean, as, yeah, as of yeah. like a few months ago, I don't know what the latest yeah. data is, but right. it's interesting. Yeah. It's like, everything's a question mark. There's like little peaks mm-hmm. of hope. And then, yeah. and then as per usual, we get um, bad news is around the corner every time. Yeah. Um, but sorry, Jen, what was your question? No, <laughs> but I think, you know, partnerships, picking partners, picking to do it all yourself, like this keeps yeah. coming up. So, you know, vetting partners. How do you do that vetting? With our, with one of my earlier features, we tried to vet, we got good report from other filmmakers, but we had a similar experience, Katie, to your husband, like, mm-hmm. I mean, nothing, and they were terrible, and they went under. And now that film is there, people watch it, it has good ratings, somebody's making money on it, I have no idea who is, like, it's not me, you know? And I don't have the resources to lawyer up and track down. I mean, it's it's not gonna happen, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do you, how would, how do you guys personally, and how would you advise um, people to vet those partnerships? Because Gravitas might be good for one situation and not for another, right? It's like, how do you decide and what questions I think should filmmakers be asking? 
I, I can answer this. It's all about community. You have to dig in and build a community of other filmmakers who will be honest with you and tell you what they're, hey, here's my spreadsheet. Here's, you know, and they're not going to put it online, mm-hmm. but there's, there's people out there who will be transparent with you because they want you to succeed. You know, here is what happened to me. And, you know, I think the more um, transparency that is out there. I mean, it's really hard. It's really hard for people to be transparent that they feel like they're, you know, risking something or risking a relationship that might help them down the line, but they'll, they'll share it with you privately what they might not share publicly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think sometimes, you know, especially with directors, you know, we're so like, it's my vision, it's my story, you know, (laughs) (laughs) and, you know, but, but even within the directing, you know, community, like we have to talk to each other. I, I just think that's the only way. Yeah. Also, there's an entire business that I'm going into, which is people consulting on distribution. And I, you know, I have the confidence to go into this field because of people like Peter Broderick and Keith Ochwad and Mia Bruno and Rebecca Green and Rebecca Sosa. I mean, there's a lot of us. Um, but just having worked in creative distribution for so long, filmmakers will just email me and be like, I have to tell you a horror story. (laughs) And we're repositories of horror stories of distributors. And we don't forget. Um, We remember names and we remember situations and we remember really, um, we remember just like all the horrible ways we get taken advantage of. So if you can afford a consultant, great. If you have a community, great. But also you could just cold email a filmmaker on a distributor's Mm -hmm. website and just be like, did you have a good experience? How was it? Mm-hmm. And they'll probably tell you. I had a, a friend like drive me to meet someone at Gravitas. She loved them so much. And the wow. woman I met there was fabulous. And she was like, you must go with them, you know? And then I had somebody else right. being like, mm, that was, that was not, uh, not ideal for me. So there is also too that kind of, uh, you know, flipping of the coin. Like you're going to hear different stories from different mm-hmm. filmmakers. Some people are going to love them. Some people, it wasn't ideal. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, it's probably your gut as a filmmaker, as so much in filmmaking is, you know, it's like, at the end of the day, it's often our gut that tells us this is the person I should work with over that person. And when you've done it enough, you really learn to trust that gut and and find Mm -hmm. what works for you. Because we all have a different project with so many different factors, a different audience we're trying to reach. It's, you know, thinking you're going to cut and paste or emulate someone's, you know, I think that happens too with the big film festivals. You hear someone's story. I'm going to emulate their story, but you're not because you're not them. You don't have their film. You don't have the same talent in your film. Yeah. Yeah. It's also really hard because, um, you know, you, you love your baby, right? No one wants, you don't want anyone to tell you you've got an ugly baby, (laughs) 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 you know, or your baby's not going to make it into Harvard. They don't have the IQ, but you, you, so finding these people like Liz and, and, and Keith and Peter, like who will be who kindly will tell you the truth, you know, here's where your movie is a fit here's where your baby can go to school and have a great life you know Mm -hmm. and that's you know it's important to find people who will tell you the truth like that you know and um you know uh i i I worked with film collaborative as well in in terms of uh, as if they were my fiscal sponsor and they you know like oh they they shared some things with me all right you're right you know i i I made a film that's very uh very particular very has a very particular bent and that that doesn't mean that it's you know that's it. it'll live where it will live and I've come to terms with that and I I kind of love my 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 baby who's you know IQ maybe isn't you know 45 <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah and there there really is a place for every film um I mean now more than ever people are watching content and they're wanting to connect with content and and use um film in the way that it's intended which is to open people's eyes and hearts and provoke them and, you know, maybe enlighten them. Um, So if you can tap into the intent of your project and then look to the community of filmmakers that maybe had similar intents, um, I think that's a great place to start. And finding people like myself and Liz who know a lot of distributors and sales agents and have gone through the landscape with many different films and have seen, you know, the really peak of it to like the film that just got into like a niche market is is help it's helpful um because it can be a very overwhelming process distributing a film and it goes on forever like katie mentioned in the beginning like it's not just 
that first deal. I mean, once you're, if let's say it goes on Netflix, it's probably just for two years. And then after that, then where? Um, and so I think also, oh, so I just think it's a good reminder, picking off, of, picking back. Oh, wow. Piggybacking of what Lisha <laughs> was saying. Um, also, as a filmmaker, I look at my career as a long game, right? So yeah. one film, you know, my first film was on Hulu. The revenue from the Hulu deal was responsible for half the budget for my second feature, right? Um, and then the second feature is on Showtime, which is a much, much smaller license fee, to be super clear. <laughs> so I'm just saying, I'm just saying like, there's, um, but I don't think of it as, you know, two successes or one success, one failure or whatever it is. Yeah. It's like, I am just trying to get five films down the line, 10 films down the line. It's the long game. So if your first film, your second film doesn't succeed, that doesn't mean you're branded as a filmmaker um, who failed at distribution. You're going to have other chances. What's great about distribution is the market's constantly changing. Mm -hmm. So even someone like me who claims to be an expert, I can't possibly be an expert because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, so you can always try again on the next project. Yeah. And I think for your investors and for the people who, or if you've been crowdfunded, you know, being able to get your film out there and showing other people that like, look, I, I saw it through to the very end and I made sure mm -hmm. that it had an impact and here, you know, and create even like a package of like, look, here's the impact this film had and here's the people mm -hmm. that saw it. And, you know, you can go back to your investors and say, this was, you know, or your crowdfunding people and say, you know, here's why that 50 bucks you gave me was totally worthwhile, you know, and um, you helped be a part of the change in the world. And I think that's, a uh, you know, or you helped entertain people or you helped, you know, give people a little moment of, of respite in this madness or you enlighten them with something about immigration, you know. Um, I think they really appreciate that, you know, because they don't forget whatever happened to, you know, like, well, where's that film going, you know, and, uh, and then they can feel good about it, you know, because I think filmmaking is really hard. <laughs> this is podcast will tell you making movies is hard. <laughs> and you need a little of that, like, you know, add a boy. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. You know, like, and yeah. we're a team and we're going to make another one. And this is going to yeah. be great, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I was just muted, but I was saying we did it. Like, it just felt like we just summed up all of distribution in that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Oh, Good I, job, ladies. <laughs> of course. I, I hope I'm back. I think it's, it's, it's been great. And I was just actually going to say, um, any parting, you know, bit of a gem that you didn't feel like you want, that you want filmmakers to, to say and that you didn't say. And, and piggybacking on Katie, too, also with your actors. This is mm -hmm. what I found. When you follow through and they get their copy, they get their credit, they get a mm -hmm. royalty check. I mean, we had an actor when we were shooting from that immigration film, we were shooting in Portland. It was a small role, but she said, fly me up. Don't even pay me, just fly me up. I wanna be in it. I wanna work with you again. And it was such That's a relief true. for us because there were a lot of moving parts in that project. It was very overwhelming. So to know here's one box I can tick. That's I've really worked cool. with this person. I know they'll be prepared. I don't have to worry about it. And she had offered that because on a micro budget indie film in LA, she'd never gotten a royalty check and she got several, like we did what we said we were going to do. And I think also if you're in the narrative landscape, seeing it through, you know, makes a huge difference to your actors and actors talk to actors. So even if you're not ever going to work with that actor again, you do not want an actor bad mouthing you to other actors, you know, the world is small. So I think also that goes a long way too. In, in, in crew, cast, crew, all of it. Everybody, if you've seen it through, people will want to work with you again or refer you. If you haven't seen it through, it's, you know, it, it can be a lot harder to build that, that reputation that you want. Um, but yeah, any parting, parting words? I, I just like to say that, you know, now more than ever, independent filmmakers really have to fight for their projects and, and there is, a, there is still a lot of opportunity for independent films. And it's, yes, it's gonna be a little trickier to film right now because of all the COVID restrictions. Yes, the distribution climate's a little bit uncertain, but just wanna encourage the independent filmmaker that the, your voice is so important because it's so unique and we need that so much right now. So just wanna encourage the filmmakers to keep, keep up that fight, which can be very challenging. 
Um, I guess I would say, um, you know, don't underestimate the, the impact of a good thank you note, (laughs) 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 you know, for the people that have given you help, you know, because sometimes, and and the other thing I would say is, you know, you don't know sometimes what you don't know. There's Mm -hmm. so much to learn. And so, you know, just yeah. keep asking questions, keep, you know, learning, uh, especially if you're new at it. I'm sure there's people watching this who have much more experience, but, you know, and they, they, they know this, but, but, um, uh, you know, there's always more to learn and everything is changing. And, um, and it is, it is all, and I really still do think that social media and reaching out to people and saying thank you to your, the people that supported you are just really, really important. Um, uh, you know, and also being humble, remaining humble, you know, and saying like, uh, is there something else I can learn? Because it, it allows people to to give to you, you know, and say, hey, I do know, I want you to succeed. I want you to to help. But if you, I've known, met a lot of filmmakers are like, oh yeah, I know, I know, yeah, I know. I'm like, okay, well then I'll just go over here and I don't have to tell you anything, you know? <laughs> you know, okay, I guess you got to figure it out, you know? But if, you're, if you keep an open mind, like there's a lot of loving, good people in the filmmaking, especially independent world who really want you to succeed, you know, even if there's no benefit to them whatsoever. They just love this indie DIY free voice, you know, that does, you know, and they want you to succeed. And I've, I've given free advice to so, so many people. And I love it. Free advice to me many, many times, (laughs) many times. Thank you. You're so welcome. It's my pleasure. You are so awesome. So (laughs) that is why. Um, thank you. Uh, that's really sweet. Um, I would say, um, yeah, similar, similar to what everyone's saying, but like, keep going. I, I found that, um, I started writing during the pandemic and I hadn't written for four or five years and I started to find, joy in just imagining and just like writing things down that were fun and ridiculous and things that I wanted to see. And I'm doing a horror film. So it's like kills. I want to see it's like, it's real dark, (laughs) Um, but like gross things I want to see on camera. It's not as all, it's not all rainbows, unicorns. It's weird and twisted, but, um, (laughs) but like, there's a reason we were uh, inspired to do this in the first place, get involved in this industry. And life is, clearly way more complicated and chaotic and horrible um, now, but uh, try to go back under the covers of that imagination that makes mm-hmm. you feel safe and warm and brings you joy because, um, you know, we're talking a lot about the business and all these complications and all these terms and all this education, um, but the core of it is telling stories and, and finding joy in doing so. So don't mm-hmm. forget that and um, just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I'm um, really excited about the stories that are going to come out of this mm-hmm. period of time. Like, I think, yeah. you know, sometimes when there's enormous amount of pressure, like that's what makes the diamond, right? Like, mm-hmm. you're like, wow, what came out of that person's mind? Like, I'm like, Liz, what's going on in there? <laughs> <laughs> Real dark. It's a dark it's, place right now. <laughs> who knows? It might be hilariously funny when it's all done. You'll be like, wow, I thought I was writing a horror. Now it's a freaking comedy. You know, <laughs> Good way. But, uh, you know, you just never know. And so I, I, I always have hope for the creative during these periods of time. And just like, yeah. we, you know, we want to be like, we need you, we need you, we need you keep, you know, like, keep, and it's contagious. Hope. It's contagious. That, that joy and creativity is contagious and everyone needs it right now. Yeah. Totally. Well, and so that being said, what are you working on? What are you guys watching? We just want to wrap with that mm. real quick. If you want to plug anything you're working on or something you're watching and loving, and um, I'd just love to hear that too, right before we wrap up here. Um, I guess I could say I have a short film that's going around. Um, it's next going to be at the Mystic Film Festival, October 22nd. It's called Burnt Feathers, Broken Wings. I did it with a group called Kids in the Spotlight. It's about foster kid girls. It's a documentary about foster girls struggling with addiction. Um, so that's been going around. And then I produced a documentary about child sex trafficking called Lost Girls Angie Story. And that's playing at the motion. Oh my God, I forgot what it's called. Um, uh, it's playing this weekend and you can go on my Twitter and, and see what film festival is playing at um, this weekend. Um, and, and then in terms, you know, I'm, act, I'm doing some acting. I'm COVID acting on, uh, on, a, so on a TV show right now. So, which is a trip, you know, I, my, my nose is very clean from all of those <laughs> things going up there. So, <laughs> 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 yeah. Wow, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. 
Um, I'll start with what I'm watching right now. I got really engrossed into a Spanish uh, web series called Cable Girls. Uh, it's set in mm -hmm. the 1930s, like early 1930s, right around the time of revolution and their independence from the king and all of that and, um, and the suffragette movement in Spain. And it's really fascinating to watch right now with our political climate, kind of seeing that um, feminist struggle that happened in another country, very similar to what we experience in the United States, but we just don't hear about it from the perspective of other countries. So I've been watching that um, in Spanish on mute while I tend to my child at the at all hours of the night. <laughs> and the subtitles are great. Um, and then what I'm working on right now is I still have a full slate of feature films that, that I'm developing. Um, I just, um, I'm in the middle of possibly picking up an animated TV series um, that would kind of be geared, it's like a, kind of like a spooky, um, it's all about ghosts and warlocks and things like that. And it'd be geared towards like the, um, like f probably four to eight year old kind of demo, a little, a little bit younger. And then my features are all for kind of like eight to 12 year olds that kind of pre, pre, preteen age, right before you get to start to get really jaded with the world, trying to um, inject a lot of empathy and hope um, into, into these kiddos before, before that. Um, one is a really, really cool take on a Christmas project and it's, it's set in the North Pole and I cannot wait to film that one because that's just gonna be so much fun. Um, and then uh, I have another one that, that kind of brings the, um, the mis mysticism of Harry Potter into a much more realistic tone because all the witches and warlocks are living among us. Um, so that's gonna be really fun to realize as well um, when everything settles. Um, and then of course, supporting filmmakers and with their distribution journey is, I have um, two projects right now that, that I'm working with the filmmakers on, on that. Yeah. Liz? Um, I'm re-watching Haunting of uh, Hill House because I loved it so much. It's just one of the best things I've seen in the past few years. Uh, also watching The Masked Singer and British Baking Show. I mean, just like crap yeah. and then like horror opuses. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I'm in a very, very long pre-production for a feature that I was supposed to shoot in June. Uh, so we may be shooting next summer. It's called Lady Parts and it's a cancer comedy and mm -hmm. Jen knows it well. Uh, and then um, I am writing this horror film, which is uh, tentatively called Friendship is Hell. And it's um, a feminist film about the perils of female friendship. And it is um, really, really fun to write. <laughs> uh, but also, yeah, if, and if any filmmakers want to talk, um, I'm happy to be there just as a sounding board as well. I'm a consultant, but I also wouldn't turn anyone away if they just wanted to get some advice. So um, feel free to reach out. Um, so, where can they reach out to you, Liz? Oh, my name, Liz Manischel at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be writing. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's, yes. Thank it's the all. Moving Parts Film Festival. I'm so sorry. <laughs> moving Parts. That's moving perfect. Parts this Sunday night if you want to watch it, that, that one. And, um, and there's a, I'll, a, one other thing I forgot to mention was there's a, a, a play I filmed before COVID. Mm. And uh, that's going, coming out, I think, at either end of October or early November. Um, and we're going to be sharing that for free through the theater's website and on a few other channels just to sort of share some free live theater that we shot three camera handheld um right. which is uh, came out really well it's called paint made flesh and we adapted that into a screenplay and that's sort of i just finished that this summer and so that's the next film that we hope to make that's awesome yeah well i'm <laughs> so inspired by each of you and what you're doing and i thank you for spending some time with us today um i'm wealth of knowledge very very helpful so thank you all for sharing your your time with us and good luck with all of these amazing projects Really, really thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, Jen, for hosting us. <laughs> yes. Great to be on with all of you ladies. Yes, you as well. Thank you. Okay, bye. <laughs>